April 4th, 2024 marked the fourth day of jury selection in the Chad Daybell trial. It was another long day with a ton of jurors, but it was a day that definitely made progress. Yesterday, at the end of the day, we were sitting at 37 out of 50 jurors. Now, there was a surprise mention of a last minute motion. A juror called John out and John even talked about his love life today, surprisingly on all accounts. I do daily recaps on jury selection and give you details and highlights about the day. I'll be covering the trial too. When that begins, it's going to be a lengthy eight to 10 weeks. I have over 200 videos on the case covering deep dives, timelines, Lines, connecting dots and theories. I'm Linda with It's a Crime, so now let's get into it. Before we get into the day, there's something that came up that East Idaho News reported on. It was a motion that was filed to delay Chad Daybell's trial, but details about its content and the reason behind it remain undisclosed. The motion was submitted by Terry Ratliff, a lawyer based in Mountain Home, Idaho, through the iCourt portal. Wendy Olson, who's an attorney hired by EastIdahoNews.com, along with prosecutors and the defense, were served the motion. And Judge Bull Boyce instructed the attorneys not to share the motion and he later sealed it on Tuesday and the motion's filing time was noted and the judge expressed concern about its attempt to intervene in the proceedings. Now both the prosecution and the defense requested the court to seal or strike the document. The judge temporarily sealed the motion and plans to schedule a hearing to decide its fate. What do you think about all this? I want to hear your thoughts and discuss it below. So part of the motion reads... On March 29, 2024, at 11.42 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, a non-party presented for filing its motion to intervene and to continue the trial in these proceedings. Counsel for the state and counsel for the defendant alerted the court after they received notification of service through the court's e-filing system. Both the state and the defense have raised concerns about the impropriety of this attempt to intervene procedurally and substantively. Additionally, both the state and the defense have requested the court immediately seal the document or alternatively strike it from the case. Now on page three, it says that the parties who were served was Lindsay Blake, part of the prosecution, Rob Wood, John Pryor, who's the attorney for the defendant, Terry Ratliff, who's an attempted intervener, and CC'd was John Thomas James Archibald and Wendy Olson. Super interesting. I want to hear your thoughts on it. Let me know below. There's definitely never a dull moment in the case. It seems significant enough though to prompt both the prosecution and defense to request its sealing or striking from the case. Again, let me know what you think about this below. So the jury selection started at 8.56 a.m. today at the Ada County Courthouse in Boise, Idaho. And at the very beginning, Judge Boyce stated that there was an absent juror and they must arrive or provide a satisfactory explanation by 5 p.m. Failure to do so may result in a $500 fine and a maximum of five days imprisonment. Now, I wouldn't want to be that person. But in day two, there was a person who didn't show up, but it was because his phone died and he said that it was an honest mistake and that he's actually in the military and knows what on time is. Nate Eaton, who has been been doing an awesome job of reporting this whole case and updating us and also updating us in Twitter, mentioned who was in the courtroom today. And he said, notably, there was a Madison County Sheriff chief deputy <laughs> seated behind prosecutor table, a private investigator who's seated behind the defense and nine members of the media slash public, including a man named Tom Evans, who was a juror in the Lori Vallow trial. And he was number 18 in her trial where she was found guilty, obviously, of murdering her children and her husband's former wife, Tammy Daybell. She's going to go on in August to another trial for Brandon Boudreaux and Charles Vallow. And this juror was recently interviewed and said he's concerned for the jurors in Chad's trial, particularly because it is a death penalty case. He empathizes with the responsibility and believes in upholding the law. He said in Lori's case, he would have supported the death penalty if it were an option. Now, remember how I mentioned there was a juror who called John out? A juror wanted John to repeat the question because he rambled on and 
she had no idea what he was asking. And that, my friends, was the highlight of my day. Listen to a wide variety of music. Because at my age, I had a chance to be exposed to everything from... I've been exposed to, uh, oh my gosh, it's embarrassing, the 70s and the disco age. And I promise you I didn't wear the bell-bottom pants. But I was exposed to it. And, and I've been exposed to the movie music from the 80s and the 90s. And, and, and you know, my children, I don't understand the stuff that they're listening to. And I can't even understand the words. I don't get it. Uh, but I do listen uh, to a little bit of country music now. I find it very relaxing for me. And there's a song out there that uh, um, the, the title of the song is Everything That Glitters Is Not Gold. Okay. And 716, you had, an, you had a, an acknowledgement and you smiled. So talk to me about what you think that means. Sometimes it's really nice on the outside, but once you get on the inside, be it a person, be it uh, piece of equipment, be it whatever, it may not be the same as what you're supposed to Right. And sometimes uh, you get into it and you see this, this, this gold glitter, and it could be, like you said, it could be a job where someone has a job and they make the job sound absolutely wonderful. And then suddenly you get in the job and you find out, oh my gosh, it's too late. I'm in this situation. I don't really know what I got involved in. And you're, you're blinded. And can people be blinded by the glitter? Is there anybody who believes that you can't be blinded by the glitter? Okay. Many, many years ago, I um, was reading a story. Okay. And I'm guilty as well. Sometimes I read their stuff as well. I, I like juror number uh, 977. I try to avoid it. But I read a story about a 92-year-old uh, millionaire. And he married an 18-year-old woman. And I think that's a big age gap. Okay? Yeah. Juror 779. You're shaking your head. Okay? 70... Four year age difference. Is that an example of, uh, uh, you know, looking at the glitter and maybe not thinking it's gold? Oh, yeah, 100%. Okay. Yeah. Juror number 1078. Is that a case of looking at the glitter and not realizing that there's no gold there? Yeah, I would think so. Okay. So sometimes you, you get into these positions and, and maybe you're fooled or maybe you're tricked or maybe you're convinced of something and it all sounds really great. And I don't want to just talk about relationships. I want to talk in general. And, and you could be uh, convinced to say things, to do things, to act a certain way and be drawn into something. Do people agree that that's something that in real life, those sort of things happen? I haven't uh, spoken to 732. And you didn't give me a big nod. So I guess I'd like to see if you can talk about that. Okay. Don't want to talk. If you don't want to talk about it, it's okay. You have a lot of words in there. But I'm not sure I completely understand exactly what your question was. Or the okay. amount of verbiage that was used. Okay. Would you clarify that? Well, I, let, me, let me ask you this. Do you have any difficulties with the idea of of my song, everything that glitters is not gold. You don't live to be this age and have grown kids and not experience that in some right in some way, shape, or form. In some capacity. Okay, thank you. Also during individual voir dire, she talked about working in the past in Emerge and how she doesn't want to see anything gruesome. Her actual words she used was, I don't need to see gunshot wounds. Now, in my opinion, since she worked in that field and had seen a lot of that already, she may be more able to compartmentalize things. On the other hand, she outright said she doesn't want to see anything like that, but she's going to see a lot more than that. And she also said she wants to make an impact and by being on the jury, she would fulfill that and she was put through. Now, some funny moments. John said a couple of times when asked if he'd like to speak. <laughs> he says, ever so briefly, Judge. And you know and I know it is never, ever, ever, ever so briefly. And speaking of funny and John, he talked about his love life today. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, John has a girlfriend. <laughs> okay, 1503. 
Is that an agreement? I am blessed. And she's, you know, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I am a lucky man. I have an absolutely gorgeous girlfriend. Okay? Beautiful girlfriend. And this is going to kick back at me. I know it's coming. And I think dearly of her. I, 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 and I don't deserve her. And I don't know whether she would marry me or not. But we skirt around the issue a little bit. I really care for you. Um, I like spending time with you. I see a future with you. Um, an amazing cook. And we talk about a lot of things and we love to cook together. And we talk about a future down the line, possibly, you know, wanting to spend our lives together. I want to see the hands. If I made an offer of marriage to her, anybody think I made an offer of marriage to her, would you please raise your hand? Then I want to identify you because she may get a hold of you and say, see, he told you all these things. But nobody, nobody believes that that's an offer of marriage or an agreement, right? And even though it was verbal, there still needs to be more than just talking about the subject, doesn't there? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think I want to move on a little bit. Now, do you think he's buttering her up, the jury up, or the public who's watching or all the above? Let me know below. Now, one other juror talked about what she's heard on the media and that maybe there are some mental problems with whoever was involved in the case. She said on her questionnaire that maybe Chad looks guilty so far based on what she'd seen in the media, but said all she knew that two people were killed. She thought it was two and there was a husband and wife. And she said the husband and wife ran away to Hawaii and all she knew was that they were involved. And then she was let go. So as of yesterday, we were at 37 jurors out of 50. Today, we hit up to 44 in the first round and 52 this afternoon out of 50. And 50 is all that was needed. Now, court resumes tomorrow, but what happens after they hit their quota? There's a phase called peremptory challenge, which allows attorneys to dismiss potential jurors without providing a specific reason. Each side typically has a limited number of peremptory challenges, that's hard to say, <laughs> that they can use during jury selection. The exact number of peremptory challenges available to each side can vary depending on the jurisdiction and the type of case. But it's important to note that this type of challenge, let's just call it, cannot be used to exclude jurors based on race, gender, or other protected characteristics. So while attorneys can use peremptory challenges to remove potential jurors they believe may be biased or unfavorable to their case, they must do so without unlawfully discriminating against jurors based on their race, gender, or other protected characteristics. If a party suspects that the opposing side is using peremptory challenges to unlawfully discriminate, they can raise a Batson challenge, prompting the court to evaluate the legitimacy of these challenges. I know that John sure doesn't want any parents on the jury. I've seen this this week, and I understand why, because Tylee and JJ, you know, I get it. But what do you think? Let me know. What I do know is the prosecution has been methodical in this process. You can see it through these past four days. Their motto seeming to be stick to the plan and the process rinse and repeat. They are consistent. They are detailed. John, however, is a different story. Everything is a surprise grab bag. You never know what you're going to get. And everything that glitters is not gold was referenced in court, as I mentioned earlier. But in my opinion, this is John setting up his argument that Lori was the glitter and poor little Chad and his storm, his little tiny storm, is innocent. I have a video coming and you'll see more about Chad and what his background is. As for the jurors, you can tell those who were exposed to the media to a higher degree. I heard this week a few people called Lori by her first name basis, while some said Lori Vallow and some not by name, but all in all, I think it's been a pretty decent process this week, minus the ramblings of you know who. Check here for more videos on jury selection and here to see more about Tammy Daybell, Chad's wife, and what happened the night she died. See you on day five.